Hello and good morning, MYM Insiders. How's everybody doing today? This is Rich Harshaw, and we're here for a pretty interesting little webinar today. Um, originally, I was going to show you some stuff from Scientific Advertising, a book by Claude Hopkins, and I still am going to do that. I've actually just expanded the scope of this a little bit, or maybe quite a bit, depending on how this goes, uh, because uh, I, number one, I got a little bit carried away. Number two, I just want to show you some good examples of some of the principles from that book that aren't necessarily strictly from Claude Hopkins. Here's what we're going to discover as we go through this this uh, webinar today is that there are a lot of marketing principles that have been around for well over a hundred years that we're still using today. And the only thing that's really changed is the media. If you go back to the late 1800s, which is the era of scientific advertising, in the early 1900s, I believe the book was actually written. Well, I'm not sure when the book was actually written. Probably around 1920, something like that. Uh, anyway, it was a long time ago. Let's call it roughly 100 years ago. And uh, a lot of the ads that we looked at were written in the early 1900s, some of them in the late 1800s. But some of these I'll show you actually were written much later than that in the 40s, 50s, and 60s because the, the principles and the methodologies of executing those principles did not change much really until we started getting a lot more heavily into television and radio advertising in the 50s and the 60s. And then during the 70s and 80s, you started to see some of these principles start to wane a little bit, uh, not in their effectiveness or their usefulness, but in just their implementation by a, a lot of companies. So I'm going to put a list on the screen right now, and uh, you may want to jot this down. I'll give you just a second. And let me make sure my technology is working okay. There we go. Now it's working okay. So uh, jot this down. There's 10 principles that come from the book Scientific Advertising. Now, if, you, if you're not familiar with the book, you may want to grab it. I think you can buy it fairly inexpensively off of Amazon.com. I can't imagine that this book is more than 10 or $15 at the very most, maybe less. And uh, it's an easy read. It's two books that are bound together in one volume, My Life in Advertising and Scientific Advertising. Fantastic read. Uh, a definite must read for any uh, aspiring copywriter or marketing person because this guy, Claude Hopkins, oh, it was originally written in 1923. It says on the back of it as I hold it here. Claude Hopkins lived from 1866 to 1932, worked for various advertisers, including Bissell Carpet Sweeper, Swift & Company, which was a uh, meatpacking company in Chicago, Dr. Shoup's Patent Medicine Company, and then at age 41, he was hired by Albert Lasker to write copy for Lord & Thomas Advertising Agency, which is the forerunner of Foot Cone and & Belding, and he stayed there for 18 years. Hang on just one second. Uh, the dreaded webinar scene. Sorry about that. It is allergy season. So uh, these are principles that he distilled out of his career, wrote them into these two books, My Life in Advertising and Scientific Advertising. Uh, the reason there's two books, I'm not sure. They're very similar in nature. One of them is a little bit more autobiographical, but even the autobiographical account really is more of a, of a treatise on um, principles of, of advertising. So hopefully you've had a, a minute or two now to jot these down. Advertising is just salesmanship. And, you know, this is probably one of the foundational concepts of all, and, and uh, we're going to see this as we go throughout a lot of these examples. Now, the, the, the way that we're going to go through this webinar is I've got this list right here. I'm encouraging you to jot it down so you can refer back to it because I'm going to refer back to it because every other slide from this point on is simply going to be uh, pictures of advertisements that are old. And we're going to discuss how these concepts on the screen, offering service, headlines, being specific, telling your full story, use of pictures, research and information gathering, using samples, testing, and then uh, creating a personality, how these 
come into play with these ads. So the first set of ads we're going to look at about, uh, let's see here, probably about uh, 15 slides worth are going to be for Volkswagen Beetle. And let me go ahead and put the first ones up. And this is a con this is a uh, ad concept that ran uh, in the 1950s and 60s, I believe. Now, just a couple of notes. When we look at old advertising, you have to sort of throw your political correctness out the window. It, it was a different era, and uh, it doesn't really help us to judge that era, other than to look at the principles that are being utilized and see if they make sense. So if we take a look at this first ad, uh, the uh, Volkswagen Beetle, sooner or later your wife will drive home one of the best reasons for owning a Volkswagen. Now this <laughs> probably wouldn't go over really well right now uh, in 2014. However, let's take a look at what it says. Women are soft and gentle, but they hit they hit things. If your wife hits something in a Volkswagen, it doesn't hurt you very much. Volkswagen parts are easy to replace and cheap. A fender cost comes off without dismantling half the car. A new one goes on with just 10 bolts for $24.95 plus labor. And a VW dealer always has the kind of fender you need because that's the one kind he has. Most other VW parts are interchangeable too inside and out, which means your wife isn't limited to fender smashing. She can job the hood. I don't even know this word. Grooze the door or bump off the bumper. It may make you furious, but it won't make you poor. So when your wife goes window shopping in a Volkswagen, don't worry, you can conveniently replace anything she uses to stop the car, even the brakes. Now, again, maybe a little bit offensive, and uh, I can certainly remember when I was a kid in the 70s, a uh, situation where my mother uh, pulled up too far in the garage in the car and hit the uh, the freezer that was in the garage. And my dad, indeed, was furious, and it was just one of those 70s kinds of moments, I guess. But uh, if you look at this in terms of salesmanship, offering service, the headline being specific, telling the full story, this really does a fantastic job. Just take yourself back to the era when this type of language was appropriate. Disregard the, uh, the current disappropriate or inappropriateness of it, and look at this from the standpoint of, We've got a great photo. We've got a headline that hits something very, at the time, timely, and it tells a good story. The story, the selling point, obviously, is that you uh, can repair these for inexpensively, quickly, and easily, and it does a good job of, of making that case. Next ad, Volkswagen doesn't do it again. Beautiful. It's not any longer. It's not any lower, and it's not any wider. The 1969 Volkswagen, 13 improvements, ugly as ever. Beautiful, just beautiful. And they're playing on the fact that people considered the car to be ugly, and they didn't change it. And uh, you know, we haven't made it beautiful. It's just the same old car, just a little bit better. I love this ad because I love the use of white space. Something that Volkswagen does very, very well in a lot of their ads. We'll show you a few more of them as we go through this. But again, this headline, fantastic. What is the salesmanship point? We have an ugly car. It's functionally ugly, and that makes it beautiful. And, uh, you know, it's reliable year after year. They said it couldn't be done. It couldn't. We tried. Lord knows we tried, but we couldn't squeeze Philadelphia 76 or Wilt Chamberlain into the front seat of a Volkswagen. So if you're seven foot one like Wilt, our car is not for you. But if you're a mere 6'7", you're small enough to appreciate what a big thing we've made of the VW, okay, it, uh, the startling, uh, besides the startling image of those uh, 1960s uh, shorts that he's wearing there, again, these ads, I think, in their day, extraordinarily powerful, tells the story, the car is small, but it's really going after the fact that it will fit a bigger person than you think. Now, if you look at the monopolizer marketplace um, methodology, Benefits of ownership, objections to ownership, vendor selection. One of the objections to ownership to this car at the time, I'm sure, that it's just too small and if you're big, you can't fit into it. And you look at this and they say, well, if you're seven foot one, it won't, you won't fit. But at six, seven, which is going to be 99.9% .9 of the population or more, it does fit. There's more headroom than you'd expect and more legroom in front than you'd get in a limousine. Now, 
what a great comparison. So again, just look at this ad. We don't need to go through the, mi the minute details of every single ad, but uh, you get the point. You're missing a lot when you own a Volkswagen. And um, it talks about all the different parts that are not included in a Volkswagen because of the type of engine that it has, uh, the cooling system because of the air-cooled type of thing and how that makes it more efficient and gets better gas mileage and so forth. All right, I've got to do a quick technology update here. Okay, next, everyone comes, every new one comes slightly used and it talks about how they go through and they road test these cars. Also, again, putting this car into an environment where you would not expect to see this type of a car, which is out mudding, okay? Volkswagen unique construction keeps dampness out. I don't know if the car actually can float or not. For years, there have been rumors about floating Volkswagens. The photograph shows that one stayed up for about 42 minutes. Why? The bottom of a Volkswagen isn't like an ordinary uh, car bottom. And it goes on to talk about how it's different, keeps dampness out. Again, a uh, sales point. I love the way that these ads don't just show the car. They have the sales point. We're selling the car. We're selling the car. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, we used to play the slug bug game, and these cars were flipping everywhere. And I think there's good reason. They did a great job of selling the car. Contrast that with the way cars are sold now, which is typically based on, hey, look, here it is, and all the car ads really seem to be about the same. We have chosen not to disturb your Sunday morning with a surprisingly ordinary prices advertisement. This is very similar to the uh, zero dollar coupon <laughs> that we've put out there. Volkswagen, everybody's filling in the blanks on that blank sheet with the picture of a Volkswagen. They know what it looks like. We've also made a very strong comment about the prices. Okay, Ugly is only skin deep talks about how this uh, car is ugly, but it, uh, you know, performs beautifully for all these other reasons. If gas pains persist, try Volkswagen. This is a little bit more uh, recent, I think, getting into the 70s. Gas prices start going up. The uh, plop, plop, fizz, fizz was all the rage in the 70s and the 60s, and we've got the Volkswagen being the relief for gas prices. Very clever little ad, if you ask me. It makes your house look bigger. Again, emphasizing the fact that it's a small car and it can make your house look bigger. Okay, we'll just kind of run through these. I like these ads. Hopefully they'll uh, bring a smile to your face, but also give you uh, some ideas from advertising standpoint. Again, remember, advertising is salesmanship, offering service, headlines, being specific, telling your story, using pictures, using samples, testing. Okay, why do we put such big wheels on our little car? And uh, we could read to find out more about that. It's ugly, but it gets you there comparing it to the Lunar Lander. Lunar Lander is not very uh, beautiful, but it does the job as well. Let's keep going. Last one to conk out is a Volkswagen. Kind of like the uh, last one there is a rotten egg. Last one to conk out is a Volkswagen. It's going to be the last car. It drives through water. We've already seen that. I don't know, maybe in those days getting trapped in water that was rising was a problem or a fear that people had because there's two ads we've seen on that now. Live below your means, letting people know that it's a nice car, but it's uh, inexpensive. If you'd like to get, out, to get around the high cost of living, we have a suggestion. Cut down on the high cost of getting around and buy a Volkswagen. It's only $1,799. That's around $1,200 less than the average amount paid for a new car today. Leave it in the bank. More's coming. A Volkswagen saves you hundreds of dollars on upkeep over the years. It takes pints, not quarts of oil, not one iota of antifreeze, and it gets about 27 miles to the gallon. The average car thirsty devil that only gets 14. So the average car only gets 14. Wow. Thank you, 1970s. So the more you drive, the more you save, and chances are you'll drive for years and years since we never changed style. Volkswagen never goes out of style. Of course, Volkswagen is not much to look at, so a lot of people buy a big, flashy car just to save face. Try putting that in the bank. I love this, this concept of the car is ugly, deal with it, making fun of it, embracing it, and really turning it to an advantage. 
this is really great marketing, hence I'm putting it on webinar. Think small. Our little car isn't much of a novelty anymore. A couple dozen college kids don't try to squeeze inside of it. The guy at the gas station doesn't ask where the gas goes. Nobody even stares at our shape. In fact, some people who drive our little fiver don't even think 32 miles to the gallon is any great is going on any great guns. We're using five points of aisle instead of five quarts or never needing antifreeze or racking up 40,000 miles on a set of tires. That's because once you get used to some of our econ economics, you don't even think about them anymore, except when you squeeze into a small parking spot or renew your small insurance or pay a small repair bill or trade your old VW for a new one. Think it over. Think small. Cheap. New. A new Volkswagen only costs $15.95, so you might think that a used one costs next to nothing. Wrong. Used VWs cost plenty. The fact that a Volkswagen degenerates less than any other car in the world. A five-year-old Volkswagen is just as much, a, uh, I can't read it exactly, but the point is, is clear at this point. The car is not going to deteriorate, so it's going to be expensive used. What a great thing to say. Our cars are expensive used because they don't go downhill. Volkswagen does it again, four coats of paint. What a great way to demonstrate four coats of paint. We don't have to start from scratch each year because we use the same model every year. Again, they're taking the negatives of this car and they're putting them out there front and center. Yeah, it's ugly. Yeah, we never change it, but that means that the parts are interchangeable. That means that it's cheap to fix, et cetera, et cetera. Just a couple more and then we'll move to the next uh, set of ads. Slightly convertible <laughs> with the uh, moonroof. Don't laugh. We've got the uh, police car. Need a part. The best kept secret in Washington, D.C. Uh, just uh, two more here, I think. Lemon. The Volkswagen missed the, missed the boot. The chrome strip on the glove compartment is blemished and must be replaced. Chances are you wouldn't even have noticed it. Inspector Kurt Kroner did. There are 3,389 men at our Wolfsburg factory with only one job to inspect Volkswagen at each stage of production. And they talk about how they can find that little teeny minuscule defect so that when it shows up in your driveway, it's not going to have a problem. That's how many times we inspect a Volkswagen, same kind of concept there. Our number one salesman, every, even people who have never been near a VW can tell you how good the services. It's more than just a reputation. It's become a legend. Once you've got a legend on your hands, you've got to live up to it, and we do. VW dealers see, it, see to it that you get the same front door treatment, whether you're buying a new car or just having your old one greased. It's like telling, it's like, kind of like feeling you hope if you drove up in a $5,000 car, which is at the time expensive, right? An amazing new green comes, now comes in this familiar package. And it talks about uh, the longer lasting engine. All right, this is the last one, I believe. Yep, it's the last one. We finally came up with a beautiful picture of a Volkswagen. Again, making fun of the fact that it's ugly. Volkswagen starts looking good when everything else starts looking bad. Let's say it's late at night and you can't sleep, it's 10 below, and you forgot to put antifreeze in your car. Volkswagen doesn't use antifreeze, its engine is cooled by air. Let's say it's now morning, you start your car and and the gas gauge reads empty. Even with a gallon left, you should go approximately 27 miles in a VW. Let's say you notice on your way out of the driveway that every other car on your block is stuck in the snow. A VW goes very well in the snow because the engine is in the back. It gives its rear wheels better, better traction. Let's say you, know, you make it into town, and the only parking place is a tiny area between a snow plow and a big fat wall. A VW is small enough to get into half a parking space. Now let's say it's 9.15 a.m., and the other guy in the office is your boss. Now, what could be more beautiful than that? All these situations where the Volkswagen outperforms its competitors. Okay. Now let's move to the next set of ads, and we'll get to some Claude Hopkins ads. This is a set of ads that comes from a catalog that I started reading in 1990, and this is where I first became interested in scientific advertising, Claude Hopkins, and those kinds of things going on what, I guess, 25 years ago now. If you're not familiar, 
This is the DAC catalog. You can see at the bottom right hand corner of each of these ads, DAC, D A T K, DAC Industries Incorporated. It was uh, a magazine or a catalog founded by a guy named Drew A. Kaplan, hence DAC. And he had a very interesting uh, business model. What he did is he would go out and scope out interesting electronic items and then he would write these full page ads for each of the um, items and it would go through in tremendous amount of detail and explain what it was and why it was so great and how it was different and better than other things and solutions for those kinds of um, problems and he would take orders and the entire magazine or catalog was filled with just thousands and thousands of words just a few pictures very similar to what you're seeing here and this guy made a fortune until the internet ended up putting him out of business because uh, his catalog became a little bit dated but if you look at this we've got headlines sub headlines a lot of text and if you want to talk about telling the story being specific then in, in researching things this is going to be right up there with some of the best stuff you can find you may want to go online and just do some searches for DAC catalog electronic uh, catalog type ads you can find some of these online astounding writing fast I won't read all these to you but just to give you an idea why say good when you can say stellar splendid or glorious why say fast when you can say meteoric or flash why now you can add 220,000 synonyms to your writing and speaking vocabulary and you can correctly spell over 100,000 words instantly for just $99 wow and so you've got this uh, little pocket thesaurus I guess is what this is you've got uh, well let's just read a little bit of this not the whole thing but here's what we start with Forget spelling, forget racking your brain for just the right word. Now you can trash your dictionaries and your thesauruses by using the new pocket size, incredibly easy to use word finder. If you're at all like me, you hate plodding through the pages of cumbersome dictionaries. If you don't know how to spell a word, it's often hard to find. Well, imagine instantly scanning the equivalent of a 1, 1400, 8.5 by 11 single space pages of correctly spelled words and synonyms to pinpoint just the words you want just touch a few buttons and then we've got a picture here now we'll never have to use no now we'll never have to use an easy word we know how to spell rather than an eloquent word to convey our thoughts now if you go through and look at the subheadlines they're short but here's what you'll see great minds spelling made simple head of the class easy to use bottom line improve your word power risk free let's read the bottom line while 100,000 dictionary words and 220,000 synonyms may sound impressive, other computer-based source companies count words such as create, create, and creating as three entries. Using this method, WordFinder would have 660,000 synonyms. Why is a word finder conservative? Well, when you get, find, when you get your spelling and thesauruses list from Xerox Corporation and Microlytics, you can afford to be understated. So it gives a little credibility. Let's look at the next one. We won't read through these, like I said, just to kind of give you an idea. Though I'll show you several ads. Instantly, instant you digitally forget complicated answering machines, forget worn out announcement tapes. Now you can simply touch a button and record your voice digitally on computer RAM. It's incredibly easy to use breakthrough for just forty nine dollars. So it's a digital answering machine which at the time, probably late 80s, was probably a pretty big deal. It says it's easiest to use, it's only $49, and you'll notice that he's got risk-free offers on everything that he sells. The $5 calculator watch, it may be a crazy scheme, but you really can get this LCD calculator watch for just one $5 with one catch. And then it goes through, Talks about are we crazy? Compute while you com commute. What about quality? Here's the catch. Frankly, we are losing our shirts on this calculator watch, but we're looking for audiophiles who use our audio cassettes. If you buy top name TDK and Maxell cassettes, you probably pay $350 to $450 each for a 90 minute cassette. We want you to try DAX's new gold label MLX Ultra High Energy. 
energy normal bias to set, not at 450 or even 350 each, but at a factory direct price of just 249 for a 90-minute cassette. We challenge you to compare our new gold label MLX to Maxell, and you can't hear a difference, blah, blah, blah. And if you try, here's our proposition to get the DAC $5 kick. So they watch us try 10 DACs. So they're selling $25 worth of tapes and then a $5 watch. Okay. Now, if you go back to this time frame, the types of people that are reading this, this uh, catalog probably use a lot of audio tapes. What a great way to get people to try the tapes. A $10,000 challenge to escort. Let's cut through the radar detector glut. We challenge Escort to one on one distance and falsing duel to the death on a highway of their choice. If they win, the $10,000 check pictured below is theirs. What a great way to call out a competitor and put them to the test. You've got to love Drew Kaplan for his ability to write compelling copy. Okay, let's read the sub headlines only. Bob says Maxon is better. So what's dual super uh, this is a dime? So it's explaining some of the technology. By the way, Escort, we'll be happy to have our test around a, band, a bend in the road or ha over a hill. Maxon's detector really picks up uh, ambush-type radar signals. So check out a radar detector for yourself. It's uh, risk-free. The price of the radar detector is $99 plus $4 shipping and handling. Okay, next one, 15-inch thundering subwoofer. Infuse your stereo system with earth-shaking, bone-jarring bass that kicks in where your current speakers drop off. Now you can add the enormous musical impact of a 15-inch subwoofer to any system for just $149. Again, easy to hook up better base range, here's what it does, here's the problems it solves, this ad is fantastic, and it doubles as a coffee table. Five minutes to homemade bread, now this is before bread makers were very well known, now you can effortlessly make wholesome, preservative free, great smelling homemade bread in less than five minutes, you can literally dump in the flour and other ingredients, everything else is done for you automatically. So there you go takes a little bit longer. The five minute wonder discovered in Japan, mom versus the machine, fear of baking, perfected perfect dinner parties, here's how it works. Why buy it from DAC? Here's the risk free offer. Again, fantastic direct copy. Uh, probably some of the best of all time. Three dollar ripoffs exposed. Who says people can't make money with their computers. There are people downloading games, utilities, and word processing programs for free from public bulletin boards and then selling them to you for three to six dollars. Well, now you can get thousands of programs for your IBM PC, clone, or other computer mostly for free. Please help the American Cancer Society. I'm not sure what that's all about, but it talks about here's this modem so you can hook your computer up and actually get free crap off of the early uh, internet, okay? Now, let's move to some early Claude Hopkins ads. <clears throat> now, these ads are going to look quite a bit different because these are really, really old. These are from the early 1900s. Uh, I believe they date back to about 1905 to about 1915 in that general time frame. And back in those early days, the beer ads were both mostly just saying that their beer was great, it tasted good, and it didn't really give any reason. So this is one of the famous advertising campaigns that Claude Hopkins put together that took Schlitz beer uh, out of obscurity and into uh, the limelight for its day. And the, the key concepts here are advertising and salesmanship, being specific, telling stories, and making sure people understand why the beer is better. Let's take a look, aging, beer doesn't cause bilelessness if it is aged well. It's the green beer that should be avoided. Schlitz is aged for months before it's marketed. It aged in refrigeration. This process alone requires nearly 10 million cubits to get a space. The result is beer that is good for you. And uh, you'll see that the healthy beer is a uh, recurring theme through this. I'm not sure that we would necessarily endorse that now, but 
you get the idea. Schlitz brown bottle ensures purity. It can, cannot cause vilelessness. It cannot cause stomach or liver trouble. Pure beer is healthful food. Decayed food is not healthful. Any beer in light bottles is in danger of decay. No one who values health should risk taking tainted food into the stomach. Schlitz, the beer that made Milwaukee famous. Next, we double the cost of our brewing to give you pure beer. So here's what we're doing. We're going to start to price price uh, uh, condition our prospects. We spend fortunes on cleanliness. For instance, we wash every bottle four times. When one washing, done as it is by machinery, seems more than sufficient. We clean every tub, every boiling vat, tank or barrel, every pipe, every pump, every time we use it. We bore wells down to 1,400 feet to rock for pure water. We cool the beer in filtered air. We filter the beer by machinery. We store Schlitz beer for months in refrigeration rooms until it is well fermented, until it cannot cause bilelessness. We sterilize every bottle after it is sealed. All of this doubles our necessary cost, an enormous item on our output, over 1 million barrels annually, yet we pay it all just to have Schlitz beer pure, just to have it helpful for you. Those who enjoy it pay none of this extra cost, but the price is the same as standard beers anywhere. So building this case that the beer costs more, but it doesn't cost more to produce, but it doesn't cost more to buy. On this ad on the right, we have the 1915 version of a uh, sexy chick in a beer ad. Uh, in this case, she has a, a dove on her shoulder or a miniature flying dinosaur. I can't really tell which, but you get the idea. She's standing on a globe of Schlitz. Every bit of st bottle is sterilized. M. Pasteur of France invented a process for killing all possible germs of the product, we, and we use it. After each bottle of Schlitz beer is filled and sealed, it is sterilized. This is an extreme precaution. The beer is brewed in absolute cleanliness, cooled and filtered air, and then filtered. It seems impossible for a taint of impurity to get into it, yet we sterilize every bottle. We know brewing. We who know brewing know the value of purity. We add vastly to the necessary cost of our beer to assure it. You who drink it get the helpful results of our precautions. Schlitz beer is absolutely pure. Your physician knows. Ask him. Now, again, this stuff all sounds a little bit weird 100 years later, but in their day, this is the way they talk, and these were the issues that were important. Every bottle is sterilized. We've seen that. We've got a picture of, uh, I don't know what that's a picture of, perhaps a woman sterilizing a bottle of beer. Every brewer knows the danger. Warning, keep this cover on. Do not expose the light. He knows when he puts his beer in light glass bottles and practice placards the case. Keep this cover on the product to protect beer from light. He is deliberately throwing you the responsibility of keeping it pure. Why should you take the risk? Beer is saccharin. The slightest taint of impurity ruins its healthfulness. Schlitz is made pure in brown, and the brown bottle keeps it pure from the brewery to your glass. So, yeah, we don't want to put the responsibility on me for having to keep that beer shaded. Good intentions are not enough. And you see we've got this good intentions. This is a play on the uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, I think. Light bottle brewery. The enlightened public today demands more, demands absolute protection. Every brewer tries to make pure beer. Okay, keep this cover on. Do not expose to light. Oh, that's a cute uh, illustration there. Schlitz Beer receives world's highest endorsement. European government scientists award Schlitz highest honor from Wissel van Bleu, Bavaria. The most renowned school for brewing in the world comes to triumph for Schlitz. The beer that made Milwaukee famous pronounced the American beer, best American beer by the Bavarian government's famous scientist, Hans, von, Hans Vogel, director of scientific station at the Art of Brewing, subvention by the Royal Bavarian government. Bavaria is the cradle of the Art of Brewing. And then it's got some subnotes that talk about uh, you know, who this is. Our costly brewing, more and more people are demanding pure beer. This is this year we want you. We will give you a beer made from the best materials grown. We will brew it in absolute cleanliness. We will get our water from six wells bored to rock. We will filter all the air that touches it. We will age it for months so it cannot be caused bilelessness. We'll sterilize every bottle after it is sealed. And here we have the uh, sexy 1910 woman, the beer that made Will Walkie famous. 
Purity is supreme. Purity, everything distinguishes Schlitz from the common. There's a difference, of course, in the barley, the hops, the yeast. We use the costliest materials. We aged the beer for months to prevent bilessness, but the healthfulness of Schlitz is mainly due to its purity. I think this one is probably the earliest of the ads. Purity, seven points. Sterilize, same kinds of stuff. We don't need to reread it. Thin the air, which cool Schlitz beer is filtered, confined in a plate glass room. I love this one, the Indian Girl Calendar for 1909. I'm not sure that this would go over well in 19 or in 2014. The Redskins are already receiving, you know, probably uh, the anti-Indian bias. But here we go. In a panel from seven inches wide and 36 inches long, it is beautiful lithographed to 12 printings has. Rough and finish of burlap, the dates are clearly pictured on tabs of birch bark. The central figure is a beautiful Indian girl typifying the goodness and purity of Schlitz malt extract, a food a digester and a tonic. It is a richest it is richest in the food and tonic values of barley and hops. It is brewed with careful cleanliness. This beautiful calendar will be mailed upon receipt of ten cents in stamps per coin. Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company, Department 20. So that's pretty sweet. I mean, I'd love to have one of those calendars so I could check out this uh, 1909 Indian girl. The owners protect it. A partner in our business selects our materials. Another has charge of the brewing. The men who built the reputation of Schlitz beer personally protect it. The owners of the business see that all Schlitz beer is pure. And then we've got poor beer versus pure beer. Okay. The water used in Schlitz beer comes from six wells bored to rock. And again, we've got this 19 something woman who is extremely hot for her day, I'm sure. The yeast in Schlitz beer never changes. The yeast, okay? This bottle ensures the beer inside is pure. This is what purity means. And this is a, wow, they got a, they got a chick on that bottle too. When you buy Schlitz, at the price of common beer, you're getting double the value. We guard its purity. Ask your doctor about Schlitz beer. He knows the importance of purity. Tell him Schlitz beer has aged for months before it is marketed. He will say it cannot cause bilelessness. Tell him that every bottle is pasteurized after it's sealed. He will say such a beer must be germless. Ask your doctor what these virtues means to you. Can you imagine a guy having a conversation in 1907 with his doctor about Schlitz beer? It happened. The beverage of health. There is no beverage more healthful than the right kind of beer. Barley, malt, and hops, a food and a tonic, only 3.5% of alcohol, just enough to aid digestion. Rhine wine is 12% alcohol, champagne 20%, whiskey 40%. There are no germs in pure beer, while the sweet drinks which you give your children are full of them. Pure beer is a tonic, which all physicians favor. They prescribe it to the weak, the rundown, the convalescent. They recommend it to people they want to keep well. But get the right beer. For some beers are not helpful. Schlitz is the pure beer, a clear, clean beer, the filtered and sterilized beer, no bacilli in it, nothing but health. And Schlitz is the aged beer that never causes bilelessness. Cause, call for the brewery bottling. That is awesome. Let your home beer be Schlitz because of its purity. Get the good without the harm. Doctors of two nations agree as to the benefits of beer. American doctor, to what doctor do you attribute the success of the German people? German doctor, to one thing, my dear doctor, just to their temperance. American, but doctor, we think your people as heavy drinkers. German, ah, but the drink is beer. While other nationalities have their wines, whiskeys, and vodkas containing large percentage of alcohol and very little food value, we stick to our beer with nourishing barley and tonical hops. And only three and a half percent alcohol. American, you say only three and a half percent alcohol, as though that ingredient were not beneficial. I do not mean it in that sense. We find alcohol has as a food and stimulating value in the proportion if the proportion is not too great. The danger is an overstimulation, impossible when the percentage is so small, as in beer. And it goes on and on. This discussion with the uh, 
American doctor and the German doctor, and therefore we can probably uh, attribute the rise in Nazism in World War II and preceding that to beer. I don't know. Ask your doctor about Schlitz beer. He knows about the importance of purity. Okay, now we get into palm olive soap. This is some additional Claude Hopkins campaigns. These are brands that when he took them over were virtually unknown or largely unknown, but he took them to very, very high uh, levels of sales, and they've you know, become household names even 100 years later. Use palm olive soap. Avoid effects of sun and wind. Escape injury from dust and smoke. Palm olive soap furnishes, furnishes just the protection the skin needs by keeping it healthy, firm, and soft. This is not a new theory. In fact, old as the pyramids. And it talks about how this soap goes back to, you know, the, the, the theory of the pyramids and health back then. My sweetheart, 10 million sweethearts between the ages of 2 and 80 have clear, beautiful complexions as a result of using palm olive soap. soap. Unlike any other soap you have ever used, palm olive is a revelation. It is more than a mere soap. Palm olive is different. It does more than soap. Any soap you've ever tried, it brings life and health to the skin. It soothes, nourishes, cleanses, and beautifies. It positively charms every user. And then the subheadlines say, Choicest product of the Orient, pure soap, lathers freely in hard water. Daily Oriental perfume lasts much longer than other soaps. Art calendar. To open-minded women and the men they like to please. Mm. That ad would be probably received a bit differently in 2014, but let's go ahead. Here are some facts and photographs about nature's choicest food. Our ra <laughs> racial food, exceeding meat and nutrition, hearty, delicious, and cheap, yet a dish which millions never tasted in its fittest form. And it's talking about Van Camp's pork beans. If you go to the book, My Life in Advertising, Scientific Advertising, he goes through uh, quite a uh, quite a bit of detail about advertising uh, pork and beans and getting it into the mainstream as a food that people would take with them to lunch out of the kitchen. Now, just a little background on this. Pork and beans used to be something that was homemade routinely, a very common dish made by wives for their families. But it was uh, very difficult to make. You had to get the beans. You had to soak them. You had to cook them. You had to season them. It took a long time. It was a big pain in the butt. These guys started sticking it in cans and selling it so you could just open the can and eat it. And uh, it was not taken uh, very seriously in the initial um, in the initial offerings because people looked at it and figured, well, geez, if it takes us so long and it's so hard to do, something coming in a can must stock. It must not be that great. And these ads were an attempt to mainstream these type of canned baked beans, the national dish, you know, with baked with tomato sauce. Scientists, not chefs. Why no other kitchens anywhere can match a Van Camp's creation? Nine culinary methods offer multiplied delights. Okay, new method pork and beans. It goes into details. What were they trying to do again? Is to make a, a, a case that these beans are healthy. They're delicious. They're Every bit as good, if not better, than homemade pork and beans, and if, certainly with a lot less hassle and effort. My dear, these surely are Van Camp's. Men know when you serve Van Camp's beans, and the children know. The flavor is not like the beans are mealy and whole. The tomato sauce made from whole ripe tomatoes is something. Anyway, you get the idea. Your way versus our way. And again, if you go to my previous discussion, this is an attempt to help mainstream canned baked beans. And it talks about your way and how hard it is. You bake your beans in a home oven, 200 degrees. Uh, it requires fierce heat to break down the beans. You bake them in a dry heat. It takes a long time. It breaks the beans down. It doesn't, you know, it makes them less healthy, et cetera. Here's how we do it. I can't read that text. It's too small. You don't know what you miss. You don't know 
you who don't use Van Kemp. Beans are nature's choice of food. 23% nitrogenous, 84% nutriment. Like meat in their food value, not like it in cost. They are appetizing and hearty. People like them. All people like them. They should be a daily dish, not an occasional. We, you will eat more of them when you know Van Camps. We pay three forty-five. We pay two dollars and ten cents. We have spent forty-seven years perfecting this dish, and Van Camps now commands by several times over the largest sale in the world. They work to help keep you young. Listen, madam. And uh, we've got baked beans in 1860. She was not happy because she had to make them herself. Baked beans in 1911, the nutritional dish. Oh, excuse, yes, the nutritional dish. She is happy now because she can pull them out of the can. Goodyear tires were not well known before Claude Hopkins got a hold of them. So let's see what Claude has in store for Goodyear tires. And let me give you just an idea of where we're at. Uh, we'll just go through, well, just a few more ads here. Better tires, better sold. From the very beginning of the motor truck industry, Goodyear has led the introduction of new and better types of tires, enabling manufacturers to build machines more and more efficient. First came hardcore rubber-based tires, strikingly better than any former tire, yet a crude promise of Goodyear's present product. Then came the first demountable than the Preston type, the greatest single advance in the making of tires for trucks. Okay, Blue streak belts do better work at lower cost. He goes in, he tells the story, he has headlines. Advertising is just salesmanship. Good use of photos. No wonder blue streak belts are displacing cheaper ones. Before the days of high materials and labor cost, executives consigned belt buying to routine channels and the purchases were made on price. Since even a 10-minute shutdown due to interior belting costs many times more than the best of belts, executives, and it tells a story about how the low quality was actually costing them more money. The tale of Goodyear tires. We have invented a tire which can't rim cut called Goodyear rim, no rim cut tire. Over 500,000 have been sold to date. The method of fitting any standard rim lets us make this 10% oversize, and we do this adding 25% to the average tire mileage without extra cost. Because of these features, our tire sales trebled last year, jumped to $8.5 million, yet those patented tires during most of the year cost one-fifth more than other standard tires. This year, at an equal price, 64 leading motor car makers have contracted for Goodyear no-rim cut tires. The demand is greater by 6 to 1 than our than for our clincher tires. This avalanche of favor due to the savings of millions seems like a sudden sensation, but back of it all, there are 12 years of tire making, of invention, experimentation, and ceaseless tests to make you a better judge of tire needs. Please let us tell you about them. And then it goes through and talks about here's what a tire is, here's what a tire should do, here's some of the problems with conventional tires, and uh, yeah, it, it sells tires. Goodyear no rim cut tires cost nothing extra now. Last year, these patented tires cost 20% more than standard tires, yet our tire sales jumped to 8.5 million, multiplied three times over that in a single year, all because these Goodyear tires uh, cut tire bills in two. Now these same tires, these oversized no rim cut tires, cost no extra price. Our multiplied output has cut the cost of production. You can get all of these advantages by simply specifying Goodyear no rim cut tires. That's a very interesting and eminently believable sales proposition. Note how good years dominate in every street. All right, now we're going to go to puffed grains. Puffed grains were invented in the early 1900s, and Claude Hopkins made puffed wheat and puffed rice household staples when nobody else could figure out how to sell them. All America This Week helps itself to puffed grains a twilight story about puffed wheat. When you serve a super, di super dish of puffed wheat and milk, make this your story sometime. It is like a fairy tale. Each bubble of wheat is a kernel puffed to eight times its normal size. All, all its thin, airy flakiness is due to steam explosions, and each has been shot from guns. 
100 million explosions. Now, this was the story that really made puffed wheat and puffed rice take off. 100 million explosions got shot from a gun. Each kernel of wheat contains, as it grows, more than 100 million food cells in it. Each cell is hard and hollow. A trifle of moisture is in it. Each must be broken to digest. Other cooking methods break part of those food cells, but never more than half. So Professor Anderson, a famous food expert, sought a way to break them all. Puffed grains are made by his process. The grains are sealed in huge guns. The guns are revolved for 60 minutes in 550 degrees of heat. Thus, the bit of moisture in each food cell is changed to steam. Then the guns are shot. Each food cell explodes, and the grains come out puffed to bubble, as you see. This makes whole grains wholly digestible. Every atom of every element is food. That's why countless mothers, every mom and, and night, serve these grains to children. Oh, every morn and night serve these grains to children. Your, you find these fascinating dainties. You call them food confections, whatever. Okay. It tells the story of how they were shot out of guns. Tell it to your child. They'll be thrilled. And it actually worked. Telling kids that grains were shot out of guns was very interesting. Food shot from guns. And it's got this cannon, you know. Noted scientists explain loads, 100 million food cells in every grain of white wheat and rice. That's what makes puff grains more easily digested, gives them the nourishment of hot cooked cereals. Does your food cost too much? No matter how much food you can buy for a dollar, it costs too much. It doesn't contain 100 cents worth of food value. Quaker Oats is greater in food value and costs less money than any food you can buy. Read this testimony from London. Package from Quaker Oats cost 10 cents and will make 30 plates of porridge or the equivalent food value of 60 slices of bread, the best and cheapest food you can eat. How much difference is due to oatmeal? We have canvassed hundreds of homes which breed children like these, the wan and anemic and rod-cheeked and the strong, the capable and the deficient. Here are some of the facts we found. So here's these <laughs> terrible children that we found uh, in the tenements that were not uh, eating properly. Where children are fed with oatmeal among the homes of the educated on the boulevards in the higher class sections and university districts, an actual canvas shows that seven and eight regularly serve oatmeal. So if you want your kid to be rich and prominent and wealthy, then you're going to feed them oatmeal. We look at this now and we think, well, it's kind of goofy and stupid, and who's going to believe this crap? And the answer is, go watch an infomercial for a second, okay? It's the same kind of an idea. And the answer is, in this day and at this time, these ads were extremely powerful. A little bit of automobile advertising, the advantages of low-tension magneto and make-and-break spark as employed in the Model H Studebaker. How will your car be built? We won't go into detail on these. My Farewell Car by Ari Olds, the, the uh, founder of the Oldsmobile. He was retiring, and this is the last car that he built. Um, the car that marks my limit. I have no quarrel of men who ask, for, ask more for their cars, none, of, none with men who ask less. I have only to say that after 25 years and creating 24 models and building tens of thousands of cars, here's the best I know. I will call it my Farewell Car, priced at $1,055. Now, that's funny because this is in, what, 1910 or 15 or something like that? And uh, the what was the uh, Volkswagen Beetle 50 years later was selling for 1595 I believe. So this was an expensive car back in its day. What an engine did. My fame as a car builder after 26 years based on large parts of my engine. To me, it's an old, old story. Perhaps it is new to you and tells how he built these cars a real 1913 car. Here's some things which you should look for in a 1913 car. A car without them lacks things you should have. Each a lucky car. and every make, an occasional car proves almost trouble-proof. No breakdowns, no repairs. The man who gets it tells his friends he got a lucky car. But every buyer of REO, the fifth, gets a lucky car. This is how I insure it. Now, if you didn't quite follow that, He's saying that in normal cars, 
most of them are going to break down, but every once in a while you get lucky and you get that one that doesn't. He's saying that all of his are that lucky car. Okay, if I bought a car, here's some things which I'd require if I bought a car. I've learned their need by building 60,000 cars. I could, I could say if I judge $200 per car by building Aria the fifth without them, but you might lose three times that by the lack. Again, justifying this premium price. Pepsodent, toothpaste, the mistakes that ruin millions of teeth. Take this 10-day test to show millions the way to white teeth. Why teeth discolor? Supplied on request, 10-day tube for free. Five new ways to whiter, cleaner, safe, safer teeth. They're trying to sell white teeth even 100 years ago. Why that tartar if you keep teeth clean? It's due to film. Watch it disappear. And now a new way to lighten cloudy teeth. Strategy in advertising, the climax of salesmanship in print. This was actually an advertisement that was offered by um, the Lord and Thomas Advertising Agency to essentially help people with advertising as a way to get advertising clients. So they put together, I believe it was a book, and you could get that book. A reminder, right, Lord and Thomas, for their latest book, Real Salesmanship in Print. This is a book that was written by Claude Hopkins. Safe advertising. They were using their own methods to sell advertising to get new clients. Mr. Advertiser, what does this mean to you? The effective service now at your command. The new wave, what do these men do? Our ad writers, no extra charge. How fortunes are made in advertising. How to make advertising as safe as a bond. A new Lord and Thomas book, Clever Maneuvers, Strategies, and Advertising, Telling Men How to Make Money, the Advertising Agents of Today. Okay. These are just a couple of ads that I stuck at the end. We won't look at these. We have some good uh, smoking ads that we could look at. The Doctor's Choice, Camel. If the world looked like this and you wanted to buy a car that sticks out a little, you probably wouldn't buy a Volkswagen Station wagon, but in case you haven't noticed, the world doesn't look like this, so you've got to buy a car that sticks out a little, just just so you know what to do. All right. Cool and refreshing. Refreshing. Still only five cents. Now it's the time for Jello salads. I cannot imagine eating a Jello salad with olives in it. Uh, and then finally, why? Look for this ad over carefully. Circle the items you want for Christmas. Show it to your husband. If he does not go to the store immediately, cry a little. Not a lot, just a little. He'll go. Husbands, look at this ad over carefully. Pick out what you want, what your wife wants. Go buy it before she starts to cry. Anyway, these are some fun ads. The concepts, going back to the beginning of the webinar, advertising is salesmanship, offering service, headlines, being specific, telling the story, use of pictures, research and information gathering, using samples, testing, individuality, creating a personality. They're encompassed here. So. That's what I have for you today. Hopefully you found this to be a little bit interesting and unusual and a little bit different, but uh, certainly educational. So that's what I have for you. We'll talk to you next week. We've got an ad clinic next Tuesday and an uh, insider's open forum, so I hope to talk to you then. See you. Bye now.